Welcome to the Accessibility Summit sponsored by the Southwest Center on the ADA at ILRU, Independent Living Research Utilization, endorsed by the Joint Council of Extension Professionals and hosted by the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service. I'm Julie Robinson with Arkansas Extension. We're excited to have Karen McCall with us today. Karen is an, is an accessible document design consultant and trainer for Carlin Communications. Karen is the owner of Carlin Communications and has written several books on creating and working with accessible documents, as well as books on how to use Microsoft applications from the keyboard. Karen has been working in the field of accessible document design since 1998. Karen's a member of the committee that establishes the accessibility standards for PDF documents, and her website, carlincommunications.com, has several free tutorials on accessible document design and how to use tools in the office applications if you're using the keyboard or without adaptive technology. Today, Karen is going to be presenting Accessible Word to PDF. Karen is going to share an overview of the tools and techniques used by document authors to create more accessible Word documents. Karen's got a lot of ground to cover today, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, and I'd like to welcome everyone um, to the webinar. Um, one of the goals of today is to just understand what is possible. We only have an hour, and I've tried to fit as much as possible into this hour to give you an idea of what we can do in Microsoft Word to make documents more accessible. You will notice that when I talk about accessible document design, I will always refer to documents that are optimized for accessibility or that are more accessible. I will never guarantee or say that a document is completely accessible. There are too many different types of adaptive technologies that we are learning more about how to create accessible documents. And when I look back from 1998 until now, I mean, even within the last few months, Microsoft has added some techniques and tools to their Microsoft Word application that allow us to now have column and row titles on tables, which we didn't have six months ago. So the whole field of accessible document design is changing as we understand how those of us with disabilities are accessing digital content and what our needs are the tools are changing so that's why i will never say that a document is completely accessible they're always optimally accessible or they are more accessible there is a handout that goes with this uh, presentation and it gives you the step by step again just think of this as an introduction as to what is possible. At the very core of accessible document design, we look at document templates. Most of us will open our Word application, we have a new blank document, and we either start creating styles, modifying styles, we start flinging formatting at things, and then when we have to create a different type of document, like a report or letterhead or something else, then we simply go through and modify all of our styles or add new ones again. And that creates a real dog's breakfast of confusion in documents. One of the things that I recommend is that if you are doing a report, you create a report template. If you know you're going to be needing letterhead, you do a letterhead template. You do a newsletter template. You can even do a document template. Save your normal document template uh, and kind of use it as a, as a memo pad type thing. So when you do create a template, for example, you're going to create a report template. Then you can go in and modify all of the heading styles so that they have the branding and the look and feel that you want or need for your organization. And anytime you need to create a report or a newsletter, a letter, use letterhead or memos, anything like that, you're going to have a consistent look and feel because you are using the template. There are two ways to save your template. If you go to the file backstage area and save as, the keyboard command is Alt plus F and the letter A for save as, you can either tab to or use a keyboard command sequence to move to the area where you can name your document 
and then save it as a template. By default, you're going to save it in your Documents folder, unless you've changed it in the Word settings, and it's going to be saved as a DOCX document, or just a regular Word document. When you choose Document Template from the Files of Type, which is the second area that you would tab into to edit, you're going to choose Word Template. And as soon as you do that, your folder changes. You're now going to be saving your document template in your Documents folder, but in the Custom Office Templates folder. So every new template that you create or that you download will be saved in your Custom Office Documents template, unless you are working on a network and someone has changed that. Sometimes organizations like to keep um, document templates in different places, but by default, they should save in your Custom Office templates. So remember to give your template a meaningful name so that you know exactly what it is that you're going to be opening and using, and to save it as a Word template. And that means you can then open that template and make any changes that you want to the font or the font size, the colors, the alignment, anything like that. If you're using the keyboard, well, even if you're not, there's a faster way to do this. I just press F12, so the function keys are along the top of your keyboard. Press F12, it automatically opens the file or the Save As dialog. I type the name of my template because that's where my focus is. I press tab once, I choose Word template, and again, automatically it's going to be saved into the Custom Office Templates folder. So the best thing to do is to create a template for every type of document that you are going to create. Now, if you are deciding on fonts and font sizes, you can create your basic template. So letterhead, for example. And then you can simply resave it as a different template. So once you have your letterhead template saved, make any changes to the headings and the colors, and then save it but this time give it a different name, like report. So now you have, uh, you've saved time because you've based your new template on an existing one. Sounds a little confusing. Again, read the um, handout for this. When you press Alt plus F and then N for new, you open the templates gallery. And by default, you're going to see all of the templates that are available to you. You have to go to your personal templates. The keyboard command is E for personal. And that is going to show you all of uh, the templates that are in your custom office templates folder. So you can choose the one that you want. You, this is keyboard accessible. However, I usually pin my template to my list of recent documents and then simply open a copy. As someone who does use a screen reader and the keyboard, this is a more effective way to work with templates. If you are most dependent and you can visually identify the template that you want to use from the templates gallery, that's probably going to be your faster way to, to do it. The templates gallery is keyboard accessible, but you cannot use first character navigation. Those of you who do use adaptive technology, such as a screen reader or text-to-speech, will know what I'm talking about. You can't press R for report or L for letterhead. Styles are the foundation within your template to optimize a document for accessibility. In the styles, you have a normal paragraph style, you have your heading styles, there is an intense quote and a quote style, there is a title style. So for a title of the document, you would use a title style, there is a subtitle style. So every component of your document has a style that you can use and modify. And there are several tools that you have available to you in order to create new styles, modify existing styles. One of the things you need to avoid is direct formatting, and I call it flinging formatting at text. This slide has an image of some text. There is a heading that is identified visually, there is a paragraph, and then there's another paragraph in very small text. Actually, it's eight point text. And what I've done is select that third or second paragraph, and I have 
put direct formatting on it. I've actually gone up to the ribbon. I've said instead of this being the default, which is 11 or 12 point, I'm going to make it 8 point. The problem with direct formatting is that if someone finds that difficult to see, if they create their own style set, their own set of fonts and font sizes to use with a document, what you have said to Word is that no matter what anybody says, always make this eight point. So while the rest of the document may scale and adjust to the person's preference for font and font sizes, that paragraph is going to stay as it is. It's not going to be scalable. It's not going to be as accessible as it could be. So we want to avoid direct formatting. Another example of why we don't use direct formatting is when we fling formatting at topic changes. So instead of using a heading style, we simply select text like introduction or historical perspective, and we make it bold, we make it italic, we make it blue, we make it larger, we fling formatting at it. And when the adaptive technology sees that, because we haven't used a heading style, it's seen as a plain paragraph. So while visually you can navigate through the image on the left, because you can visually see where the topic changes are, for those of us who are using text-to-speech or screen reading, we have the effect that you see on the right. Everything in the document is a paragraph, so there's no way to navigate. We use heading styles as navigational structures and points in a document. So instead of just flinging formatting at something, we need to make sure that we use the heading styles. The other advantage to using heading styles is that you do have a consistent look and feel to your document. So if you're not the only one who's revising this document, if someone else is looking at it and they see the text on the left, they often guess. And I've remediated enough Word documents to know that people do guess. They don't actually go and look at the ribbon to see what the font and font size is. And so you, again, end up with a dog's breakfast of formatting in a document and a document that has all kinds of barriers to accessibility. If you use styles correctly in a document, then someone who is accessing Microsoft Word, they don't have to be using a screen reader or have low vision or a learning or cognitive disability, can create their own style set. So if you go to the design ribbon in Word and you open, you press S, so Alt plus G and then S for styles, you're going to see a lot of different ways your document can look. And those are style sets. This slide has an image of three different style sets. The one on the far left is one that I actually created. It's a large print. I call it a large print style set. So if I create my document to be optimally accessible, as soon as I apply that large print style set, all of the content, whether it's a bulleted or numbered list, whether it's content in a table, whether it's headings, whether it's paragraphs, is all going to scale to match my style set of large print. In my large print style set, I have heading 1 at 20 point, heading 2 at 18 point, heading 3 at 16 point, and my text is at 14 point. So I can distinguish uh, the headings from the, the rest of the text and the heading levels because they have a different font size. The image in the middle is one of the onboard style sets that you can use. And notice that the style sets that come with Microsoft Word do not always have the best color contrast. It's one of the things that you have to look at. One of the advantages to style sets is that if you see something that you like better than the default style set, you can apply that to the document, you can make some modifications to the colors, and then you can save it with a different name. So, for example, we also have the image on the right, which is another style set that does not have good color contrast. But if I like the fonts and I like the font sizes, what I can do is make the changes to the color and then go up to that design ribbon, go to the styles gallery, and then there's an option to save it as a new style set. So I can even take something that's there that's close to what I want and then save it with a different name. Um, if I wanted to make the, the one on the right, if I wanted to make it uh, black and white, I could call it a black and white style set. 
If I wanted to make the print larger and the fonts blue, I could call it blue large print. So I can give the style set a name that is meaningful to me. As people who remediate documents, once the document is accessible, then you, when you give it to someone, they can simply swap out what you've done if they can't see it or if they prefer something different for something that they can see a little bit better. One of the questions that I get asked at every workshop is what is the best font and font size to use for my documents? And the answer is to pick one. As long as it is a standard Unicode font and Calibri and Cambria, which are uh, two of the defaults that come with Word are standard fonts. Uh, Times New Roman is an older font and is being sort of deprecated, not used anymore, as is Arial. Although they are still around, um, we are building more accessible fonts. If you subscribe to any of the listservs that talk about dyslexia, you'll know that currently there are about five to ten different fonts that are specifically designed for people with dyslexia. So as an organization, choose a font, choose a font size. Uh, my business uses um, Calibri, no, Cambria, which is a serif font and 12 point. I depend on those little ligatures, the little hooks on the letters to be able to read content visually. Whereas most people will say use an Arial font or the Calibri font that has none of those little hooks because it's more accessible. I find that visually confusing because like if a D and an L are together, I can't see that there's a D and an L together because there are no little hooks on the on the, the letters. So even those of us with visual disabilities have different needs and different preferences that make documents optimally accessible for us. And that's why it is critically important that you use styles and you create your documents to be optimally accessible. When we look at things like bold, italic, and underline, those are old typewriter types of formatting. The bold has been replaced with a strong style, which gives you more flexibility in terms of what you can do to make text stand out. Italic has been replaced with an emphasis style, and again, it gives you more flexibility as to what you can do with something that is to be emphasized. There isn't an underline style, and so generally in a template, I will create one. And it's just a basic underline, but it applies the style, and I could also then combine um, formatting. But the style is a wrapper that contains all of the attributes for your fonts. The one thing that I will say about italics is to use them sparingly because italics can create barriers for people with learning cognitive or visual disabilities because you have fonts that are slanted, that are thin and thick, and can represent a barrier. So with bold, again, you don't want to make everything bold because then nothing's bold. With italic, you want to use them sparingly so that you aren't creating readability problems. Underline is one of those things that I generally don't use because I don't want people to think that something is underlined is a hyperlink and that I have changed the, the look and feel of a hyperlink. Um, so I generally avoid using underline. The other thing to keep in mind that all capital letters are the most difficult font attributes to read by anyone with or without a disability. And I actually had someone in a, um, in a training session ask, well, can I use small caps? No. Um, caps are used for acronyms. They're also, I think, used for boilerplate items in legal documents because people really don't want you to read them. The problem with all caps is that it removes our ability to use our own word prediction. We often read by looking at the shape of a word, and if everything is a block letter, there is no shape to the word. And so it slows everybody down in terms of their ability to read. So again, use all capital letters sparingly. We have several tools for working with styles in Microsoft Word. The most commonly used one for those of us who are using the keyboard is the Apply Styles pane. And you access that by pressing Control Shift S for styles. There is also the Styles pane 
and there is the Quick Styles Gallery. One of the things that I've done in Microsoft Word is to put the Apply Styles pane in my Quick Styles Gallery, which is that little area just above the Home and Insert ribbon uh, in Microsoft uh, Office applications. Uh, well, actually in Microsoft Word, because the other ones don't have a um, ability to put a Apply Styles pane up there. And what that allows me to do is to use a, a shorter keyboard command. And because I work with styles on a daily basis, I simply go up to the Apply Styles pane, I type in the style that I want to apply to this text I've selected, and it's applied. So I don't have the Apply Styles pane actually open. I simply bypass the, the dialog, the pane, and go right to the Quick Access Toolbar. This slide has an image on the left of the Apply Styles pane, and there is a style in focus. It is the normal paragraph style. So your normal paragraph style is going to be used for all of your paragraph text. It's going to be the basis for your headings, then the basis for your list paragraph style. So at the very sort of uh, bottom or top, whichever way you want to look at it, is your normal document, a uh, normal paragraph style. Again, if you don't like the way that the default is in Word, you can modify that and make the changes you want. The image on the right is the Apply Styles pane in my Quick Access toolbar. And if you accept the default, it's going to be placed after the last item that Microsoft puts on your Quick Access toolbar. And the keyboard command to access it is Alt, Pause, and then the number five. And that will put focus in your Apply Styles pane. It will select, or sorry, it will have selected the style that is in use. And then you can simply type in the style that you want to use. The other two tools that you have are the Quick Styles Gallery, which is shown on the left, and the Apply Styles pane, which is shown on the right. Now, one of the things that I recommend is that you use the keyboard command to open the styles pane. It is just faster than trying to take the mouse and target that small little icon in the lower right of the quick styles gallery. And I've identified that in, in blue so that you don't have to sort of strain your vision to look at it. It is small and it is sometimes difficult to target. If I'm typing and I've so selected something that I want to apply a style to or I want to create a new style, then I press Alt plus F, or sorry, Alt plus H for the home ribbon, FY. So Alt plus H, FY, and then my styles pane opens. If I want to close the styles pane, I put my focus on the document and I press that keyboard command again, Alt plus H, FY, and that will close my styles pane. The styles pane lists all of the styles either recommended or in use in the document. If you want them to appear alphabetically, you can also do that for your template. At the bottom of the styles pane is an options link and by accessing the options link you can then choose to show all of your styles alphabetically and you can apply it to this document only or to new documents based on this template. One of the things I suggest when you are using styles is that you select the text that you want to apply a style to. So for example, if you are creating a heading style or putting a heading in your document, you create, select the text that you want to make the heading and then use one of the styles tools to then apply that heading style. What that does is confine the style to what you have selected and you don't end up with formatting spilling over into other things. I mentioned before that you can modify the styles. So all of those styles that were listed in the Quick Styles Gallery, you can go in and modify if you don't like them. And the way that you would do that is to, if you're using the keyboard, you're going to use the Apply Styles pane, and then you're going to tab to the Modify button. If you are using the Styles pane, you can move to that style using the up and down arrow, 
press your application key, which is on your keyboard, on a normal desktop keyboard, it is usually between the control and the alt key on the right hand side of the main keyboard area, or you can use the right mouse click and open the context menu. This slide has an image of the normal st uh, paragraph style with that context menu open. So I've selected the normal paragraph style in the styles pane. I have either used the application key or my rightmost button and the second item down is modify. When I press enter or click on the word modify, the modify styles di dialog opens, which is shown on the right hand side of your screen. And then I can make some changes to the normal paragraph style. Normally, the only thing I want to do with the normal paragraph style would be to change the font or the font size. I don't generally want to change the alignment from left. Uh, full justification does create an accessibility barrier because it creates those rivers of white in the, the text and creates a readability barrier. So generally, I just want to make sure that my font is the one that I want. Um, sometimes people will use a Verdana font. Keep in mind that the Verdana font is a display font. It was designed for use on a computer screen, not necessarily on a printed page. So if you know your document is going to be printed, you may not want to use the Verdana font. And most people are not using Verdana anymore. They are using the uh, Calibri font that comes with Word because again, they've made improvements to the readability and the clarity of the, the font. I mentioned before that headings are navigational structures for those of us who are using screen readers and text-to-speech tools. As someone who uses a screen reader, I can get a list of headings in a document and navigate to a specific point. So I don't have to read the entire document until I find what I'm looking for. Headings must be sequential. One of the discussions that is going on in the community of accessible document design is possibly allowing people to create poorly structured documents. So whereas PDF UA1 says that headings must be sequential, you move from a heading one to a heading two to a heading three, you can then move back out to a heading two or back out to a heading one, but you do not skip headings. You don't move from a heading one to a heading three or a heading two to a heading four. And the discussion is that you know we can't force document authors to really make well-structured documents is, is the argument. So one of the things we need to consider as document designers, as accessible document designers, is that when we are looking at the content we are going to put in our documents, we have to structure it so that we do have sequential headings. If I'm reading a document and something moves from a heading one to a heading three, I think I've missed heading two. We see this on web pages a lot. Pe people will use a heading level five or a heading level six because they like the look of it. And they don't realize that using cascading style sheets or modifying the way that a heading one looks, that they could have the same look and feel of the heading four, uh, five or six, but use the correct structure. So one of the things I really want to emphasize for those of you who are new to this field is that when you are remediating documents, when you are creating documents, make sure that your headings are sequential. You will find really badly designed documents where this might not be possible, um, but by and large, what I do is I, I tend to restructure the document. And if you are working in PDF remediation, you're going to come across this a lot. You're going to look at something and you're going to say, what the heck heading level is this? And you're going to make a determination that you need to provide sequential navigation for those of us who can't see. And sometimes even visually, you can't tell which um, heading level is used. This slide has an image of the same text that we saw when I was talking about flinging formatting it at content. But now I have applied heading styles and you can't see the difference. And that is the strength of using 
heading styles is that I now have a way to navigate this document, but based on the fact that someone had flung formatting at it, I have the same look and feel and I have a consistent look and feel. When I apply a heading level one, it's going to be the same no matter where I apply it in the document. And note that Word documents and PDF documents can have more than one heading level one. My heading levels two is always going to be the same because I have all of the attributes for a heading level two in that heading two style. So I've created something that looks exactly the same as we saw earlier in this presentation, but it is 100% more accessible. I mentioned earlier that those of us who use screen readers and some text-to-speech tools can get a list of headings in the document. And the image on the right side of the screen shows you a list of headings from the JAWS screen reader. I can use first character navigation, so I can go to I for introduction, I can go to C for contact, I can go to H for historical perspective. I can also go down this list of headings and get an idea of how the document is structured and what content is a high level um, topic and what the subtopics are underneath it. And again, that's why the sequential use of headings is critical. For those of you who don't use screen readers or text-to-speech tools, the image on the right or left is the navigation pane in Microsoft Word. So you can access this using Alt plus uh, W for the view ribbon and then K for navigation pane. And it's only K because all the other letters were taken with other things. And it is a toggle, so again, if your focus is on your document and you press Alt plus W K, you're going to close the navigation pane. I leave it open all the time because as I format text for headings, as I apply that heading structure in my document, I can see it immediately in the navigation pane. So I know whether I've uh, got a bad sequence, whether I've moved from a heading one to a heading three, I know where my main uh, topic changes are, where the subtopics are, everything that someone is going to see who uses a screen reader, you can see in the navigation pane. So you can actually see how we are going to navigate the document topic by topic. There are keyboard commands to apply the first three levels of heading style. And again, select your text, Control, Alt, and the number one will apply a heading one style, Control, Alt, and the letter two will apply a heading level two style, and control alt and the number three will apply a heading three style. In Word, control alt four, five, and six are not used for anything. So if you know that you are going to use those um, heading levels, you can create a custom keyboard command for your template and it will be attached to your template. Again, I want to emphasize that, and there are instructions for that on the Carlin Communications website because it's a question that I get asked a lot. Again, it's important that you make sure that your heading styles are sequential. If you want to modify the formatting of a heading, you simply go to the Apply Styles pane or you go to the Styles pane. You can also right click on the heading style in the Quick Styles Gallery and choose Modify. So for example, the default I think is uh, blue and I find it very difficult to read the blue so I went and modified my headings in my um, regular documents to be black because I find them easier to see. If you want, in some documents such as newsletters, sometimes reports, you need more than one look and feel for a heading level. I find this a lot with government reports. They will want to use a, something that is technically a heading level two, but they'll want two or three different looks and feel for it. And so then you can create a new style based on an existing one. The way that you do that is through the styles pane. So again, you open the styles pane with Alt plus H, F, Y. And if you are using the keyboard, you press shift tab to start at the bottom. The one, two, three, one, two, three, fourth item is the button that says new style. 
you can click on it with the mouse and the create new style dialog opens. Notice that it looks the same as the modify style dialog. There is one important distinction when we're talking about headings. If you go back and look at the modify style dialog, or if you look at the regular heading one style, you will see that it is a style based on the normal paragraph style. And that's correct because the default headings in Microsoft Word are based on the normal paragraph style. We, are, however, are going to be creating a new heading style. And if we base that on the normal paragraph style, it's going to be seen as a paragraph. So if you do need to create a new heading style, I always give them names like heading 1A, heading 2A, so that they will follow alphabetically in my styles pane. And you need to make sure that where it says styles, ba style based on, it's based on the heading level that you want it to be. So in this case, I have a heading 2A, I think, and I'm basing it on the heading level 2. If I were creating a heading 1A, I would base it on heading 1. And now I can go in and modify the look and feel of heading 1A or 2A or 3A to be the way that I want it to be. You'll notice at the bottom of the dialog, whether it's the modify style dialog or the create new style dialog, sometimes you'll see the automatically update. Do not check that. That's what will create a dog's breakfast for you uh, because it automatically changes and adds things. The two uh, radio buttons that you do need to be concerned about is the one that says to use the changes, the modifications, or this new style for this document only or for new documents based on the template. And if you're working on a template, you want to make sure that you choose the new documents based on the template. And that way, when you do use the template, that um, style is going to be available to you and that look and feel is going to be available to you. Having said that, there is a way to import and export styles from one document to another, and that information is in the handout for this session. One of the advantages of using headings is that you can then generate a table of contents for your document, and it is easy. You simply go to the References ribbon, so Alt plus S for References, then T for Table of Contents, and C for Custom Table of Contents. Now, if you're not using Office 2016, it might be C for Create Table of Contents. If you're using an older version, um, it might be uh, C for Generate Table of Contents. Those are the keyboard commands. Do not use the Table of Contents gallery. So as soon as you go to the Table of Contents, you'll see four or five different examples of what a Table of Contents can look like. Those are done with content controls, and they are inherently inaccessible. They become keyboard traps for those of us who are using um, adaptive technology, and we can't use our regular navigation keys, such as up and down arrows or control up and down to move through the content in content controls in an effective way. Sometimes we get echoes, sometimes our, our screen readers or text-to-speech tools won't talk to us. So avoid using the table of contents gallery and simply choose to create um, a table of contents or custom table of contents. When I talked about headings, one of the things I see frequently is that you'll have an entire paragraph in a table of contents. And that's because someone hasn't understood accessible document design and they've looked at heading level one or heading level two and they say, well, that really helps me call out something in my document. I'm just going to apply that to an entire paragraph. Keep in mind, headings are navigational structures. They help us navigate to specific points in the document. And generally, we do not navigate to paragraphs or table cells. We navigate to topic changes. So to avoid having this happen in your table of contents, what I suggest is that you either use the quote style and modify it, or there's an intense quote. There's also an intense emphasis that is kind of like a call out. 
I don't find those particularly accessible because of their color contrast and the use of italics, so I go in and I modify them to make them more accessible. When you choose to create your table of contents or your custom table of contents, you have the table of contents dialog. Some things to remember. By default, you are going to create a linked table of contents. So when you convert this to tagged PDF, that linked table of contents is going to be available to those of us using adaptive technology as well as to those of us who don't. Just as using the heading styles are going to make the navigation in a PDF document available to us, whereas flinging formatting doesn't. So by using heading styles, we now have within our Word document two layers of navigation. We can navigate by heading, if there's a table of contents, then that's a second layer of navigation. You also, I just def accept the defaults because I need those dot leaders, the little dots that go from the text on the left to the page number on the right. If you don't have those little dots and someone is trying to follow across with their finger or even visually, you often either go slightly up or slightly down and end up with the wrong page number. If you put the page number at immediately after the text, then for people who are using screen magnification or who have learning or cognitive disabilities, the page number gets mixed in with the text and becomes unreadable in a lot of instances. So the best thing to do, keep the dot leaders, keep the page numbers as they are, make sure you don't uncheck the checkbox for the linked table of contents, so just accept the defaults and activate the OK button. Here, this slide has an image of a regular table of contents. So if you've created, used headings, simply did Alt plus S, T, C, Enter and this is my table of contents. So it does get that easy. And if I want to update my table of contents, I've found a spelling mistake or I've added something, then I can simply put my cursor in the table of contents, right click or use the application key and choose update field and it will update my table of contents. So as I'm adding and editing my document, I can also update my table of contents. One of the things that I've done in my books is that I have adjusted the table of contents or TOC1 style. So your table of contents is created using styles. For every layer uh, or level in your table of contents, there is a corresponding style and it's called TOC for table of contents. So TOC1 is your first level. It, that's the one that takes your heading level ones. And what I've done in this uh, example is to put a little bit of space underneath it and made it bold. So visually, the chapter titles are going to stand out in my table of contents and hopefully they will be easier to find for people who are looking through the table of contents and trying to find a specific topic. So that's one thing you can, another thing I should say, you can do with styles is to modify the styles that are used for your table of contents. We also need to remember to put alt text on images. So for now we've left styles and we're going to some of the, the meat and potatoes of accessible document design. Alt text on images is important to let people know what an image, um, what the role an image has in a, do a document. In Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Outlook, there is no such thing as null alt text. So often when you work with HTML, you hear that the, if you put a null attribute on, uh, in the alt text area, then screen readers ignore it. Not true in Office applications. They are different than HTML and they really have no concept of decorative images and that's what alt, null alt text is used for. So if I do have decorative images in a newsletter, for example, so that I don't bore those of us who are using screen readers, uh, I simply put decorative image. They don't need to know that um, it is an image of Niagara Falls or a botanical garden and a lot of description about it. They just need to know it's a decorative image. It has nothing to do with the content. It was put in the document to take up space. If you do have an image that hopefully relates to the surrounding content, 
then you don't write an essay. You make the, t the alt text brief and meaningful. And in Microsoft Word 2013 and 2016, the way that you add the alt text is through the format picture pane. Now this is different than in 2007 and 2010, of course it is. This slide has an image of that format picture pane and the area where you can add alt text. Note that you can add a title. I don't know of many people who do add a title. It's not supported by most adaptive technology. The main thing to make sure that you have is the alt text, the description. And the description should be brief, two sentences at most. If you have a complex image, one of the things I suggest is that you create an appendix in your document and you provide a lot of detail. Um, at CSUN, if you do a search for a picture is worth 300 words, you'll find the guidelines set out by the um, Dayton Art Institute and Wright State University on guidelines for describing art. And I find them a good resource for talking about complex diagrams. And now you want to be a little bit more subjective than you, you would with, with art, but confining your descriptions, your longer descriptions to 300 words, I think is a, is a good idea. Having that information as an appendix allows us to, those of us who are using adaptive technology, to go through that information in a more granular manner. With alt text, we read all of it, we read none of it. Um, there are some adaptive technologies that will allow us to go through word by word, but generally if we miss something we have to listen to all of it over again. So keep that in mind too as you are writing your alt text for your images. Whenever possible, also use captions. And generally I take the same text I'm using for the alt text and I use it for the caption. And the reason I provide captions, again, is to provide optimal accessibility. If I print out a document, I'm not going to be able to put my finger over the picture and see the alt text. If my printer is low on ink, if I have a learning or cognitive disability, I may look at that picture on the printed page and not really understand its relationship to the surrounding content, whereas a caption will help me get that information from the document. You'll notice that in the image on the lower part of this slide that my caption is centered. That is part of the modification to the caption style I made because I always center my images um, in documents. So I don't have to go and manually do that. It's all part of the caption style. And yes, there is a caption style. See, there's a style for almost everything. Contextual links are also important in Word documents. We'll get into the discussion about contextual links in the PowerPoint presentation because it's slightly different, slightly different intent. But contextual links in a Word document really improve the readability. Often we'll see a document that has a link that spans two lines or more. I mean, some of the lines now are, are huge. And if that is in the middle of a paragraph or even at the end of a paragraph, it distracts from the comprehension. I also make sure that the links are blue and underlined. One of the things that document authors talk about is, well, if I take the underline away or I make it black, um, you know, so that it's not as uh, evident that it's a link, maybe that will you know, improve the comprehension. The problem is that if it doesn't look like a link, people aren't going to know it's a link, unless you're using a screen reader, in which case we'll hear the word link. So one of the things that you need to start doing is making sure that as you are writing, you are crafting sentences where you want to link to something in such a way that a link is, would be obvious. So for example, most of the time when I'm doing tutorials, I will tell people to download the Office Sounds from the Microsoft website because they assist in uh, the accessibility of um, Office applications. So I don't need all of that to be a link. I just need the text, download the Office Sounds to be a link. I select that text, I press Control plus K, which opens the Insert Hyperlink dialog, and that's what you have on this slide. My text is already in the text to display, which is at the top of the dialog. 
All I need to do is to copy or paste my web address. I could also type it, but usually I copy and paste it so I make sure I get it correct. And copy and paste it into exactly where my focus is when, I, when this uh, dialog launches and press enter and the text that I've selected suddenly becomes a link. Now one of the things that you'll note in the handout is that it also has footnotes. And again, I use footnotes for my tutorials because again, somebody prints this out, takes it to a meeting, takes it to a study hall. There's no way that I can tap on that text and have that website pop up. But if I have the long URL, then people have access to that if they are not viewing the digital document. This slide has two images. The image on the upper left is one of a long URL. So visually, I'm reading the first line, I'm halfway through the second line, and I have this two lines of HTTP colon slash slash blah blah blah. Those of us who are using screen readers aren't really listening anymore. But then I have to pick up the idea at the end of that link and start reading again. And for people with, who are using screen magnification or who have learning or cognitive disabilities, this creates a readability barrier, an accessibility barrier. If you look at the image on the lower right, there's my contextual link. So it's less obtrusive, it has meaningful text, and it has less of a disruptive effect on the readability of the text. The last topic that we're going to look at today, and I realize that we are running out of time, um, is the, to optimize the accessibility of tables. You always want to insert a table. So you can either use a table gallery or insert table dialog. You never want to draw a table. And you do not want to use tables for design layout. Just say no. I have a whole campaign going. Just say no. One of the reasons you don't want to use tables for design layout is that those of us who are using screen readers and text-to-speech tools, we have keyboard commands for reading general text. And then we have different commands for going through tables. And the assumption is that a table is a data table. So when we try to use our reading commands, our regular reading commands, inside tables, our adaptive technology will often say, oh, no, no, you can't fool me. I know I'm in a table. I'm going to read the cell contents. So we can miss things. We can have things repeated over and over again. We do not have the same capability of reading general text within a table that we do without a table. The other thing you need to do is to make sure you have the header rows repeat. You do not want to allow table rows to break across pages. If the contents of one cell do not fit on one page, then that content has no business being in a table. You also, if you need space, want to use the cell margins instead of pressing enter. Make sure your table has a caption and make sure that you provide alt text for the table. This slide has the two ways that you can insert a table. The image on the left shows you the table gallery. It is accessible. You can choose if you don't have a large table, data table, you can choose your columns and row numbers from there. If you do have a larger table, then you can get the insert table dialog. The keyboard commands are Alt plus N for insert ribbon, T for table, and then letter I for insert if you want the dialog or simply start selecting uh, cells for columns and rows. The ability to have your header rows repeat is found in the table properties dialog. So you want to select the two, one or two rows that you want to repeat at the top of each page, come into the table properties, and the fastest way to get there is to right click and choose table properties, go to the row tab, and check the checkbox to have the header rows repeat. There is also a way to do this on the um, table, uh, table tools layout ribbon. I find it just faster to go through the table properties. If you're most dependent, going through the ribbon is probably faster. If you are using the keyboard, I find it faster to go through the table properties. So what this will do is to allow you to have the table headers repeat at the top of each page. And I do have an example of that. 
do not allow the rows to break across pages. And that is also found in the row tab in the table properties dialog. So once you've um, had your header rows repeat, exit the table properties dialog, select the entire table, and you can do that either uh, through the context menu uh, or you can go up to the uh, table tools, layout, select table, and then um, get back into your table properties dialog. Again, on the row tab, just above the header rows repeat is the checkbox, and it is checked by default, so you want to uncheck that. So you don't want the rows to break across pages. This slide has an image uh, uh, that is an example of the header rows repeating at the top of each page. The reason that we do this is for people who have learning cognitive or visual disabilities. Uh, actually, it helps everyone. So if I'm at the top of the second page, I don't have to go back to the first page to see what my table headers are, especially if it's a longer data table or it's a complex data table. And you can have the header rows repeat at the top of each page. And there you, you don't have to, as I say, go flipping back to see what, what, does, what does this data relate to. It's right there at the top of, of each page. In order to make the space either above or below the text in a table, I generally, again, select the entire table. I go into Table Properties, go to the Cell tab, press Alt plus the letter O for the Options button, and that opens the Cell Margins dialog. I uncheck the checkbox that says Make it all even, and then I use points. So either point 10 um, at the top and point 10 at the bottom or point 15. Don't use whole numbers. You'll get a big error message. Word will yell at you. But point 10 or point 15 if you want more space above or below the text in a table to make the, it, it less crowded or to make your, your data stand out. This is how you do it. You don't press the Enter key. Alt text for tables is also found in the table properties dialog and is applied while the entire table is selected. And the alt text tab is the last one in the table properties dialog. You can get at it by pressing control and uh, tab to move through the, um, the, the various tabs in the table properties dialog. Again, we have title, we have description. Alt text I use to describe the structure of a table. I use a caption for a table to say things like um, uh, summary of sales for 2014 and 2015, and I always put the caption above the table so that someone coming into the table knows what to expect once they get into it, and to let them know that the next thing they're going to encounter is a table. The alt text I use to say that this is a uniform table or this is a non-uniform table. And a non-uniform table is, is one that has merged or split cells. Um, or please don't do it, nested tables. So I use the alt text to provide information to screen readers and, and text-to-speech tools as to whether the table is, is um, a uniform, a standard table, or whether there are some, are some anomalies in the structure of the table. The caption is used for uh, to let people know what the uh, table data is about. Now, there have been some changes in tables as of the last couple of months. The header rows repeat used to identify the TH tags if you converted the document to tagged PDF. The, this has changed. So now, if you go into the table tools design ribbon, by default, you are going to have the f first, uh, sorry, first row and uh, first column or header row and first column checked. Those are going to determine the TH tags in your table. So woohoo, we now have the ability to identify row titles, which is huge for anyone who works with data tables. Unfortunately, Microsoft has also given us the ability to use tables for design layout, which does not convert nicely to tagged PDF. It's still going to be in a table you're still going to have readability barriers. Um, there is a way in Word to try and get around that. It's just, it works, it's sort of 
works. It's not backward compatible. And I still say, as with HTML, and one of the things we have been saying in the accessible design field since WCAG 1.0 is you do not use tables for design layout, period. So resources and contact information. There are some resources on the Carlin Communications website. I have provided my conference handout for you that contains a lot of what we talked about today and what we didn't talk about today, as well as the PowerPoint information, accessible PowerPoint information. Um, I have a new book. It's all about styles in Word, and it is a primer for accessible document design, and it can be purchased through PubCom. My accessible and usable PDF documents, which is now in its fourth edition. It was first published in 2005, and I've just recently published the fourth edition, is also available for purchase. However, if you have any questions about what we've talked about in this webinar, or you are trying some of the techniques and you run into problems, please email me. The email address is info, I-N-F-O, at carlincommunications.com and it's k-a-r-l-e-n communications with an s dot com and if you go to the carlin communications website there is a page on uh, microsoft office for windows and there is a conference handout page that you'll find some free tutorials if you would like to follow me on twitter it is at carlin info with a capital k and a capital i Thank you, Karen, for joining us today, and thank you to all of our participants as well.